Today, on Commitment to Truth. You know, why do we do what we do? There's something for us to do, <clears throat> but the challenge will always be, well, why then do I want to do it? So our challenge is to become people who are active and saying, okay, God, I could try this, but as I'm moving forward, well, maybe it's not that, but maybe it's this, but we're moving and we're letting the Spirit of God lead us and guide us versus staying still and stagnant and doing no work at all. Now, someone will come to know Jesus because of your personal work. Welcome to Commitment to Truth, the teaching ministry of Commitment Church, a place for all nations. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Each week, Pastor Cedric Brown and the pastoral team at Commitment Church strive to draw you into a deeper relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, we continue a series titled, By the Book on Ephesians, A New Community. In this series, our pastoral team will take us through the entire book of Ephesians to encourage us to understand our new community identity and to practically walk it in real life. Here is Pastor Cedric, lead pastor of Commitment Church, with today's message. So number three, we find in, again, chapter 1, verses 15 through 19. We're not only a redeemed community, sealed community, but we are, mature, are a maturing community. We should be a community that is always eternally maturing. Listen to what it says, beginning with verse uh, number 15. It says, for this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom, underline that, and also revelation in knowledge, in the knowledge of him, underline that. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Why? Listen to the reason why. He just doesn't give us wisdom and knowledge just so we can hoard it. So that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the boundless greatness of his power toward, towards us who believe. So we are this maturing community and there's some key and important words that we have to dive into today. You hear what it says in verse 17, a spirit of what? Wisdom. A spirit of wisdom. This word wisdom means this. It is broad and full of intelligence. One thing I realized when I came to know Christ was that I went from a C plus student to an A plus student. Supernaturally, God will give you intelligence that you never, ever thought that you can ever have. Supernaturally. Listen, I had one of my siblings that went to prison. He went to prison reading on the fourth grade reading level. Came to know Jesus right before he went in. Started reading the Bible. Learned how to read. Life has never been the same again after coming out. The word of God gave him intelligence that a public school system can never have. Give him. So, so side note, we pray for our kids. You can, you can send your kids to public school. You can, send your, you can homeschool your kids. But if you homeschool your kids and, and only giving them wisdom of this world, they're going to always lack a bit of intelligence. And you're going to understand what this knowledge and wisdom is going to materialize and, and help you understand. Listen to what it says. It says the knowledge, this word wisdom also means the knowledge of very diverse matters. Anybody are in, in diverse issues, circumstances? The Spirit of God, through the finished work of Jesus Christ, who lives within you, gives you knowledge to deal with diverse matters. It also means the very knowledge of things human and divine. So no matter what you're going through as a human being, right, horizontally, whatever you need to understand divinely, there's this wisdom that also is given to you in this community we've been learning about. It also means this. Listen to this. It's super important. If you are in business or if you are... Uh, you have responsibilities in, your, in whatever organization. is. Mean, listen to what this word wisdom means. It is a skill 
in the management of affairs, skill and discretion in imparting Christian truth. So you have a couple of things work in there that, that the scriptures are very, very important to apply in every area in your life because it will give you the wisdom to be able to navigate strategically whatever you are going through, meaning difficult people, difficult circumstances, unique circumstances, unique people, complicated situations that you, your family, relationships, all those things Listen, God has promised us that we should be a maturing community that are learning how to deal with these things and having skill and discretion on how to assimilate Christian truth in everything that we do. Now, let me pause to, to say something which is super important. If you've been walking with the Lord Jesus Christ for six months and you're still the same person that you were six months ago, you're not maturing. If you've been walking with Jesus for six years, and you're the same person you were six years ago, you're not maturing. If you've been walking with Jesus for 25 years, 30 years, uh, and you're still the same person, you're not maturing. You say, well, how do I determine if I'm the same person? If the same issues are tripping you up over and over and over again, if your wife is talking to you and asking you to change the same thing over and over and over again, if you're still struggling on how to respect your husband as unto the Lord, honor your father and your mother, dead or alive, good or bad, you're not maturing. And as we navigate uh, the book of Ephesians, you're going to see all that stuff disclosing and how a husband should work, you know, love his wife as Christ loved the church, how an employer should handle his employees, how an employee should respect their employer, all the affairs of life we should all be maturing in. It's not about singing songs and, and only serving in a local church, which is super important. We're going to get to that as well. But it's about growing and maturing and being separate from this world and looking more and more like the person of Jesus Christ in all affairs of life. So again, a, a huge gauge for all of us. If you're being tripped up with the same issue over and over and over, over again, you have to check your maturity gauge. It's the same stuff ticking you off, tripping you up. You got to check your maturity gauge. Because maturity is all-inclusive. It's not just, okay, I'm maturing because I'm now going to church. Good. Praise the Lord. But if you're not living like the church outside the church building, you're not maturing. There's this promise of this wisdom, fundamental wisdom on how to live godly and upright. That's what the Spirit of God gives us in this community. But then it also gives us revelation. And remember, theologically proper, you need to understand that we don't know everything. We will never know everything. So there's something called progressive revelation. Hopefully, more is revealed to you the more you draw closer and closer to Jesus. Right? How can one know the mind of God? First Corinthians talks about. He says, no one can know the mind of God separate from the spirit of God. So the more and more you draw closer and closer to God through Christ, his spirit gives you more and more revelation of whom? The mind of God. And also the revelation of the mind of God is never disconnected from the authority of his word. God's mind is not contrary to the word of God. So there should be this progressive revelation. So with that in mind, listen to what the word revelation in, in the knowledge means. Things should begin to be laid bare. In other words, become naked or becomes translucent before you. It also means a disclosure of truth or instruction concerning things before that were unknown to you. So there's going to be truths that are unknown to you, but over time in this community, you should be 
you should have progressive revelation. More and more should be revealed and more and more should be understood rather than I'm stuck in this area over and over again and I have no revelation. Well, is it because God is withholding the revelation? Most of the time it isn't. Is it because it's a lack of maturity? This word revelation also means this. It is used of events by which things are states of persons or persons previously is inhibited from view are made visible to all. In other words, again, things should become more and more visible when you and I continue to live within this community called the body of Christ. One thing we should all know and, and embrace, God is not a God who is withholding information from us. Everything has been written. Everything is written. Think about this. Hebrew says this. The word of God is able to divide soul, spirit, thoughts, and intentions. Do you want to know what is really behind the veil? The word of God somehow, I can't even properly explain it to you. But the word of God is able to literally, it says the word of God is able to divide bone, marrow. Keep in mind, bone, the start of bone and the beginning of bone cannot be seen when it comes to bone and marrow. Only technology allows us to see where bone marrow is located. The naked eye cannot see where does bone start, where does marrow start. But the word of God is able to. The, the, there's theological debate on soul and spirit. Where does the soul begin? Where does the spirit begin? Both are immaterial, but the word of God is able to delineate. Thoughts and intentions. You can't see someone's thoughts. You can't see someone's intentions, but the word of God can. We must be a people who always are maturing so that we're able to delineate and differentiate and be able to navigate life in complicated seasons in our lives. Anybody in a complicated season? You either just got out of it, <laughs> right? Or are you going into it? It's one or the other. And God has given us a promise, church, listen, that if we continue to grow and mature in all of our ways, he'll give us everything we need to navigate it. Amen? We are a maturing community. Uh, number four, we find in verses 19 uh, through 23. 19 through 23, again, in Ephesians chapter uh, 1. 19 through 23, or the latter part of verse 19 says, uh, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Verse 21, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name, every name, every name, past, present, future, every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Verse 22, and he put all things in subjection under his feet and made him head over all things to the church, which is his body, the, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So here's our fourth point, is that we're in a community that is completely governed. We are in a governed community and that community is governed by Christ and Christ alone. Christ and Christ alone. And there is no other head, there is no other person, past, present, future, that is bigger, badder, has more authority than Christ and Christ alone. Period. Period. <laughs> exactly, Cece. <laughs> you know, so our challenge is to become men and women who understand this and live according to this. So how does this look and translate to our lives? There should never be any political party. There should never be a political person. There should be no created person on this side of heaven that we promote other than the person of Jesus. Because what you see in this part of the text is the biggest 
and the best and the most influential community is the body of Christ. That's why he says when the, when the salty loses its savor and the light loses its, right, and the light becomes dim or is hid under the bushel, then the whole world is affected. So the problem isn't the president. The problem isn't the vice president. The problem isn't the senators. The problem isn't the Congress. The problem isn't the, the governors or the, the local mayors and, and town officials and city officials. The problem is the church. If the church isn't seen, it loses its saltiness, its visibility, its influence in a dark, dying world. So our responsibility is, listen, we should be hanging shingles and putting signs out saying, promoting whom? Jesus. Because Jesus is the only one that would change a king's heart. I hate to say it, but listen, yeah, be, you can be politically involved, but at the end of the day, if your politics supersede Jesus, you're just going to be a frustrated politician. And that's what we see in the world today is that there's this promote, promoting, promoting of other people and things and even promoting other races and cultures above one or the other, but not promoting the person of Jesus. We're governed by Christ. How do I know this? Uh, go back and read Colossians. It should be in your note. Colossians chapter 1 in, in its entirety, verses 13 through 22. But I'm going to read verse 18 to you today. He is also the head of the body, meaning Christ, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Why? Why did he do all of this? So that he himself would come to have first place in everything. He didn't die to be second place in your marriage. He didn't die to become second place in your finances. He didn't die to become second place in your career. He didn't die to become second place to your children. He, he didn't. He didn't die to become first place in your parent, you know, uh, uh, second place to your parents, but, but he died to become first place in everything. And that's where the tension occurs, right? And that's why he told the, the disciples, if you're not willing to what? Deny your mother, your father, your sister, your brother. He didn't say don't respect and don't love your mother and father, your sister, your brother. He's saying, hey, make sure you keep things in, in check. Make sure that you keep your priorities in order. That I am first. Yes, the children will take up all of your time and all of your energy, but you, you must find a way on the inside to say, no, 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 no. They will not dethrone Jesus. Your career will be demanding, in some cases, rightfully so. Your, listen, your pursuit educationally become demanding, and rightfully so, but it still cannot dethrone Jesus, period. I don't care how, listen, you, right now you may be single, and you're praying and asking the Lord for that special someone. And you know what I always try to warn future husbands and wives of? I say, you see that gorgeous lady sitting across the street? Across from you right now, that handsome dude right there. They will compete for Jesus. They will compete for Jesus' seat. They will try to dethrone Jesus on your heart. And that's just a fact of life. And if we know that, we must be men and women who are attentive to the reality that God you will always remain the governor of every area of my life, period. In my home, privately, wherever I go, publicly, in the church, wherever, you rule, you reign, and nothing outranks you. Number five, real quickly, we are in a live community. You see, we are a community that shouldn't be dull and boring and disengaged in a community that like, you know what, I don't even want to be a part of you. 
Y'all some boring folks. <laughs> now, am I telling you, go out there and look like a world? Absolutely not. But you know what should be happening? If someone sees you as a single uh, man or woman, vibrant, celebrating your singleness, celebrating your purity, you know what? That should impact everybody else around you because they see that you are alive. They shouldn't look at your marriage and say, dang, I don't want to get married. And, and truth be told, there's a lot of people who look at Christians in marriages and say, you know what? I want to reconsider this marriage thing. Should never be that way. Listen, someone should never say, well, you know, I don't want to do business with you because the way you do business is unbecoming of the community. You have the fish on the back of your truck. You got the Bible verse on your card. But the way you live is dead, not alive. No one should ever stop by a cubicle and hear Christian music but see a life that's contrary to what it says and what's being seen, sung. And that's why if you look at this here in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, it says, and you were dead in your offenses and sins. You were dead. And please understand the context of Ephesians also. Paul's not rebuking them. He's just simply saying, hey, here's some rules from engagement. You were dead. Don't forget it. Don't forget that you were dead in your offenses and sins in which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit, small s, that is now working in the sons of disobedience. That's the way you used to be. Among them, you too also previously lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive together with Christ, it's by grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? Why did he do all of this? Why did he take dead bones and make them alive? Verse 7 answers the question, church, so that in the ages to come, we're in the ages to come, he might show the boundless riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. When people see your life, they should see the boundless grace of Jesus. They shouldn't see dead men walking. You follow me? They shouldn't see, oh, they look like the world. They should see the boundless grace of Jesus that says there is something different about that single man or woman. There's something different about that marriage. There's some, something different about that young teenager or that, that student. There's something different about that teacher. There's something different about that businessman or woman. There's something different about them. It's the boundless grace of our Lord Jesus Christ become invisible and alive through us. Amen? We're made alive. Our new community is a transformed community. It's a vibrant community because of Christ. Here's our last point, verse 8 through 10 today. Chapter 2, again, Ephesians, verses 8 through 10. It says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. Salvation in a nutshell, but it continues. Many times people only memorize the first two verses. They forget verse number 10. Listen to what it says. For we are his workmanship. You are molded by him, created by him in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. If, if everyone can just stay with me, here's the last point. This community we're part of, we're a working community. Your works cannot save you. You cannot do enough, give enough to be saved. It's by grace you've been saved. 
not by works. But we work because we are saved. And there's a work that he's prepared for each one of you in this church. Under the sound of my voice, there is a, an assigned work that he has prepared for you before the foundations of this world. Before your mama, daddy even thought about having children. Or if you're a mistake or not, at the end of the day, there was a work that is assigned for you. Now here's your challenge. If you're not working where God wants you to work, there's a problem. There's a problem. But you may say, well, Pastor, wait, I just don't know. I, don't, I, I, I can't figure it out. That's okay. But it's your job to figure it out. Now, one simple way to figure it out is this. I like to affectionately say this. Leave the dock. So many times, you know, we're trying to set sail in servitude. And it's like, oh, okay, God, can you, can you tell me, you know, give me all the navigational, you know, directions before I go? Can you make sure that the stars are aligned? Can you make sure the temperature's right? Can you make sure there's no rain? It's too, oh, it's cloudy. It's overcast. I can't, you know, we just, we talk ourselves into a paper bag. And we do nothing. Zero. And we waste precious time. And the reality is when we all die and stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, guess what? We're all going to be accountable for everything he gave you to do. And if we haven't done it, it's between you and the Lord. So our challenge is to become people who are active and saying, okay, God, I could try this, but, but as I'm moving forward, well, maybe it's not that, but maybe it's this, but we're moving and we're letting the Spirit of God lead us and guide us versus staying, and staying still and stagnant and doing no work at all. Now, let me qualify this and quantify this. You see, some people may say, hey, well, listen, you know, my work is over at the uh, animal shelter. They're cute and cuddly, and chances are you could be working there because you don't like people. Just to let you know, psychologically and medically, it's proven that a lot of people who love animals more than they love people is because they were hurt by people, and they figure the animals won't bite them back. Now, am I saying there's something wrong with working at animal shelters? No, but why are you working at the animal shelter? Is it about the kingdom, or is it about you? Why do I want to preach? Is it because I want to preach because it makes Cedric David Brown feel good or important? Or am I understanding and know there's a calling, there's a work, and if I don't do it, I will die a miserable man and have to be, and I'll be held accountable to God. And it's attached to the kingdom because I can preach every single Sunday, but it could be all about me, self-centered, self-motivated. It has nothing to do with the kingdom. Why do you want to sing? Because you think you have a good voice? You know, why do we do what we do? There's something for us to do, <clears throat> but the challenge will always be, well, why then do I want to do it? We all have a responsibility to get busy in the kingdom. Eternity is attached to it all. Someone will come to know Jesus because of your personal work. It's eternity. You see, moms, why, why do you work with your kids is it because you want them to grow up to make you feel good? Or is it because you are locked in and you realize, you know what, I love my kids. Yeah, it'll be cool if the cherry on top was they make me look good. But at the end of the day, um, my responsibility is to raise up men and women who love Jesus and who will change the world. And what I found out as a parent, if that's my main motive, I... I've realized when I landed on that, I stopped being disappointed in my children. Because, you know, when you lay that up to the Lord and say, God, my job is to make them 
uh, love, help them become men and women who are after your own heart and that will love you. So when they have those ebbs and flows and speed bumps, you're not mad because it's not your job. Your job is just to fill in wherever God tells you to fill in and the rest is up to him. And just like he transformed this knucklehead's heart, he could do the same thing to my kid's heart. And it just provides me to have greater grace towards my children. It's like, oh, it's just a matter of time. You, you are a marked kid. It's just a matter of time. Go ahead, act the fool. Get it all out. You are marked. <laughs> you know, you may come in battle scar like I did. Like, you know what I'm talking about, right? You got all the wounds and the battle scars because you chose to take a different journey. But you're going to get there one way or the other because you belong to him, not me. And it changes the whole perspective of life when you understand, you lock in and say, no, I go to work every day not to get paid, even though that's a byproduct of, product of it, but I go to work to honor you, Jesus, and make you known. My, my company exists to make you known, Jesus, not become profitable. And then, you know, the weird thing begins to happen, then your company becomes profitable. Once you lock in on the kingdom work he has for you, there's a good work, there's a useful work. One last key word before I end. The word works here, you find in verse number 10, means this. Doing someone else good. One thing about the kingdom is this, in this community, it's not all about me. It's about doing good for somebody else. But the cool thing about the kingdom in this community I'm talking about and we're learning about is when you do good for someone else, somehow good happens for you. So can you imagine if everybody's doing good for someone else, everybody in this room and beyond are taken care of? Because our good one day is going to land on your porch, on your heart, in your family, because I'm choosing to do good to everyone else. Someone once said, one can acquire everything in solitude except character. It's kind of like this. You could be at home, reading your Bible, Memorizing verses in solitude. Then you become like David Koresh. Some of you know what that is. Google it. Because the scriptures are not meant for you to just hoard them. These things I give to you, you give to a faithful few that they may be able to give to others. Solitude doesn't allow Proverbs 27, 17 to be a reality. Iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another man's confidence. Can you imagine iron in solitude? Who, who, who's going to sharpen you? You see, one of the greatest deceptions is, well, me and my family, we're going we're gonna to just huddle up. It's going to be all about, uh, all about us. And you know what happens? It becomes a dysfunctional family because your family has nothing to weigh it against. It has nothing to weigh it against. So you begin to think, oh, we got everything down pat. We're doing everything right. We're doing everything right. And you could be selling your, your family off a cliff somewhere. One of the greatest tools God gave me, I stumbled on, was another brother. In other words, who I saw love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave his very life for her. And it made me a man without excuse. I saw how he loved his son and raised his son in the fear and admonition of the Lord. I saw how he did not provoke his son to anger and wrath. I saw that with my eyes. I saw the word of God lived out in someone else's life that caused me to do the same. You can't do that in solitude. So if today you want to grow, 
don't want to grow, if you don't want to grow, remain in solitude. Take your ball, go home, play in your own little set box. Stay in solitude. You won't grow. If today you don't want to become a better you, and that's the beautiful thing about the kingdom in this community, is that God has made you the way you are, the way you think, the way you wired, your quirks, your idiosyncrasies. He's made you just like you are. But you know what he does? He wants to make you a better you. And you can't become a better you in solitude. You can. And if you don't want your family rescued generationally, if you don't want to see transformation in your own life, you don't want to see yourself restored from pains and hurts and issues and people dead, gone, relationships dead and gone, and you, you need to be restored. If you don't want to experience restoration and healing, stay in solitude. Or the option is lock in on this community that God has laid before you and you'll never be disappointed. Thank you again for listening to our latest sermon series from Commitment to Truth, the teaching ministry of Commitment Church, a place for all nations. Through this series, we hope you are encouraged to understand your new community identity. If you want to listen to the previous messages in this series, or if you want to hear messages from other series, visit Commitment Church on YouTube or Pastor Cedric Brown on Spotify, Pandora, or other podcast providers. You can also visit us on our website, commitmentchurch.org. And if you live in the Philadelphia, Delaware, or South Jersey area, we would love to see you in person as well. You can attend any of our services by visiting us at 2 Berlin Road South, Lindenwald, New Jersey, 08021. Thank you again for listening, and have a blessed and wonderful day.